Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining us once again, listeners. I've got an excellent topic with for you today. With me is John Ross from Ross and Schulmeyer, and we're going to talk about how to protect your loved one's assets from fraud, how to protect it for long-term care. And John said he could go down any rabbit hole and talk for hours. So I'm sure we have lots to discuss. So thanks for joining me, Ross or John. <laughs> I almost got it right. <laughs> yeah, that's all good. But yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Glad to be well, here. So tell us a little bit about you and what you do and if you've had any personal relationship with Alzheimer's or other cognitive impairments, how did you get into this, this yeah, field? So it's, it's kind of interesting. So I, uh, I started my law firm about 20 years ago. Uh, we, are in, uh, we are in Texarkana, Texas, which is on the state line between Texas and Arkansas. Uh, we, we, uh, we started, my partner and I started with two laptops and a card table. Um, <laughs> We are, uh, but since then, we are now one of the largest elder law firms in the South. Um, we cover uh, four state geographic regions spanning from Dallas, Texas to Little Rock, Arkansas, and into Louisiana and Oklahoma. But um, years and years ago, when we very when we first started, I was seeing a lot of Alzheimer's related questions in the office, and I had solutions. And but what I realized was people just didn't have information. And that so, very one true. Things, yeah, one of the first things I did is I walked down to our local uh, Alzheimer's Alliance and I said, "What what can I do to help?" Um, for for whatever reason, Alzheimer's has almost entirely bypassed my family, my parents, my grandparents, both sides. I have nothing and not, none of it in my family, but but I see it every day. And so I started volunteering with the Alzheimer's Alliance. I would go to uh, support groups and just be there to a answer questions. Uh, then they made me a board member. Um, <laughs> for the last eight years, I have been president of the Tri-State Alzheimer's Alliance, uh, which covers East Texas, Southwest Arkansas, and uh, uh, Southeastern Oklahoma. And um, so, yeah, um, that's, my, that's my, my delving into the world of it. So you were having Alzheimer's questions as far back as 20 years ago, which I realize is like 2003, not the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Not 1987, which is exactly when, you know, when I say 20 years ago, that's usually what I'm thinking. Um, but but yeah, um, no, it, you know, you would you would get these uh, you would get the questions you would you know, you would have folks come in and they would say, you know, uh, um, well, my mom and of course, Again, 20 years ago, right? But you would have, well, you know, my mom had that hardening of the arteries. You know, that's what they, like, you know, you would hear those kind of terms before, you know, before Alzheimer's became such a prevalent word, you know, uh, but, you know, or they would just say, uh, you know, there's some dementia. But, you know, people were concerned. They saw their parents deplete all of their resources. They saw uh, or, you know, they had a spouse who was having issues and and they were looking at the cost of care and they just didn't know what to do. Um, there were very few people in the legal community that had any real concept of this sort of stuff. You know, the old, the old, you know, estate planning, right? You go to law school, you, you, you study estate planning stuff. It's all about what happens when you die. <laughs> That's true. Right. It's, it's, here's who gets my stuff when I die and let's avoid the death tax or let's do this. But it's, it's all about the death. And it's like everybody forgot about the 20 years leading up to that point. Because if, uh, if you go broke before you die, you don't have anything to leave to anybody anyway. That is very uh, true. You know, we did a, our yeah. state planning in 2020. And because of my family history, which my mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. Her mom had vascular dementia, and my maternal great grandmother had dementia. So I'm the opposite of your family. So we had many conversations about the what ifs of between now and death, what happens if one of us gets a cognitive impairment inducing disease. So we had those conversations. They weren't fun, but you know, no, once you gonna... answer them, you know, it's really, it's like, oh, okay. It's kind of like taking the hard test. You're, you've studied, you're done, and it's like, oh, okay, I survived that. <laughs> Well, and and then what you know, once you've kind of got some things in place, and you've got a, a you know maybe some comfort that 
that some of those fears, you know, you, know, you can't alleviate the fears of getting a, a cognitive disease, but you can maybe alleviate some of the fears that you're going to leave your spouse destitute in the process or that you're going to be a burden on your friends and family um, because you're you're structuring things so that you can, you know, pay for care and and get the care you need and do all of those sort of things in the process. So that leads to a good question. How can you structure the state planning to help pay for care? Because we've kind of done that, but we probably could do a better job. I mean, we've been self-employed forever. So, you know, that makes having extra money to put aside a challenge. And right now the Federal Reserve is clobbering the heck out of real estate and my my investment accounts. <laughs> my husband's a real estate broker. So it's like, could you people knock it off? I had a lot more money a year and a half ago. <laughs> right. I bet, you, I bet that's right. Yeah. That's the uh, that's the thing about the real estate market is it is a bit finicky. <laughs> <laughs> if you like roller coasters, it's not a bad career. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, so what first thing with any with any sort of planning, it obviously is always going to be very, very specific to the individual, their their the uniqueness of their assets and things like that, right? So you know, for example, uh, I could have two different clients, uh, you know, back to back appointments. The first comes in and and it's a husband and wife and they have a net worth between their house and their and their other assets of, say, you know, three hundred thousand dollars. Right. House and car and some money in the savings. And I have another client come in that also has a three hundred thousand uh, dollar net worth, but it's a farm. No cash. You know, they got they got. $1,500 in the bank, right? Um, yep. You know, and, and they're going to use that for feed this weekend. <laughs> you know, so so here's two different people with, you know, one who's got uh, quite a bit maybe of cash assets. Well, that's going to be a different scenario. You know, they, they would potentially have the ability to pay for care for at least a short period of time compared to, say, that farmer who has zero ability. Um, you know, they have no cash whatsoever. All their their resources are tied up in illiquid assets and stuff. So first things first, it becomes very specific. Um, main thing to understand is that there's basically three ways to pay for care. You're either going to have long-term care insurance. If you're one of the, I don't know, 5% of the population, um, so that's usually out for most people. Second option is just to pay cash. Um, but at, you know, Six to nine thousand dollars a month. That's generally unaffordable for most people. And so the third option then is going to be to access government assistance, which predominantly is going to come in the Medicaid form, or you know, you're in California, so Medi-Cal. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, all of these are federal, they're all based on federal law. And so the rules, although different from slightly different from state to state, the big rules are kind of the same. Main thing is, is it's a need-based program. And so your assets are going to come into play here. Uh, and so it's, uh, to some extent, it's about how do you protect those assets? And also, so you like, you mentioned that you, you have a spouse. At there least are, today. <laughs> today, for, for, the, for the moment. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are, there are uh, uh, you know, I've often said that if I have a married couple where one spouse needs care and one does not, that I can get virtually anybody qualified for a Medicaid benefit in that circumstance because the rules will allow you to shift assets between spouses. It's a bit, it's a bit more complicated than that, but generally that's the, the, the philosophy there. Compare that to being a single person. Um, if you are a single person, you've got to be broke um, effectively, right? And, and so, well, let's take, you, you mentioned you've got a history of, of this, you know, in your family, right? So, um, so I'll just pick on y'all, for example, if, if you are to get Alzheimer's, from the time you are diagnosed to the time of your death, the average life expectancy is going to be somewhere in the 10 to 15 year range. The life expectancy of your husband will be three years. Yep. That's the, life, that's the life expectancy of the, of the, the caregiver spouse, right? Three to five. So taking that as an example, right? And, and let me back up just a little bit. But um, my wife has a disabled sister, disabled from birth. 
and um, her name's Leanne, and Leanne's great. She lives at a group home. Um, if she were if she were standing next to you right now, uh, you'd you'd already have gotten three or four hugs. Um, you know, <laughs> she 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 uh, you know, but she's from being disabled from birth. She's on Medicaid. She's on SSI. She has government housing. You name it, because she doesn't have anything, right? Right. But as wonderful as those programs are, they don't take her bowling. <laughs> and they don't want her new clothes and and or her Reese's. And she that girl loves a Reese's. Um, I mean, who doesn't? But anyway. So so all of the all of the quality of life, that was all historically provided by their dad, Jimmy. Uh, unfortunately, Jimmy got terminal liver cancer when he was in his 60s. Yikes. Yeah. And and so Jimmy's question to me when he realized he was going to die. He said, John, how do I leave behind money for Leanne? Because if I leave money to Leanne, that will disqualify her from all of these government benefit programs, um, not to mention the fact that she can't manage it anyway. Um, so I need a way to leave money for Leanne without disqualifying her. And that tool has been around for a long, long time. It's something called a supplemental needs trust. You'll also sometimes hear it called a special needs trust, but a, a supplemental needs trust. Trust designed to hold assets for a disabled individual without disqualifying them from any government benefits. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those have been around for a long time. In 1995, when Bill Clinton uh, was president, and his hometown is about 20 miles from where I'm sitting right now, um, Bill Clinton added a provision into the Medicaid rules that allowed a spouse to create that type of trust for their surviving spouse. Hmm. So, okay. for example, if you were to look at my own estate planning, <clears throat> excuse me. My stuff says that when I die, I leave everything to my wife, right? It's hers. She can bring her next husband to the funeral. Um, <laughs> off she goes, right? Right. <laughs> but it, it, instead of being a period at the end of that sentence, there's a comma. And it says that, that, yes, I leave everything to my wife, comma. But if my wife is incapacitated, if she has Alzheimer's, if she needs something like long-term care, then instead of my assets going to her directly, in that circumstance, I want them rerouted and placed in a supplemental needs trust for her benefit. Now, when I die, she gets Alzheimer's, she lives 10, 15 years, I die from the stress of being a caregiver in three, but my planning has now shielded what I left behind so that it does not disqualify her from any government assistance programs and yet can still be used to improve the quality of her life over and above the three hots and a cot that the government's paying for. <laughs> okay, so let me let me ask a couple of clarifying questions, mostly because my dad did die before my mom. Um, and I think the stress of caregiving and the fact that he didn't let my sister and I help was probably a big contribution. He had his own um, chronic health issues. So you know, they had, they had, had a, a, pardon me? I said it's also a man problem. Um, yeah, we, we we have a tendency to be overly proud that we can handle it all. That's true. And, and 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 being able to say I need help is is not easy, especially with the generational. You know, talk about like your dad. You know, that generation in particular, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't need nobody's help from nothing. <laughs> um, but yes, y'all need help out there, you listeners. Yeah, y'all need help. Take that's it. one of my that's one of my soapboxes. Get you know, there's a lot of ways to get help that aren't necessarily hands on caregiving for the person, your spouse or whoever you're taking care of, like my mom, for instance, because a lot of times they don't need that in the beginning. But you need to put a team in place for those emergencies for when you do need a team and you don't have time now because the caregiving has increased. Absolutely. So when my dad passed away, they had a trust and everything was left to my mom except in the case of her being incapacitated then it went then my sister and I were the trustees of the estate would it have been better if we had if my dad had done what you're talking about the special needs trust yeah so so for example if if that if your dad's death had triggered something like this supplemental needs trust provisions once again you and your sister would have still been the trustees and y'all still would have been in charge of it but the value 
of the assets would not have counted towards your mom's eligibility for uh, if she was also a California resident than something like Medi-Cal. Um, and so all of a sudden now you could get, uh, for example, there are home care, you know, most folks would like to stay at home if at all possible. Uh, there, there is a Medicaid programs that will pay for home care, but not necessarily 24 hours a day, right? You might get, um, you might get 40 hours a week, you might get 50 hours a week. Uh, but if you had, if, if that had been structured in such a way that here's this pot of resources there that are for mom, but they don't impact her Medicaid eligibility. Well, then, bam, we get her qualified for Medicaid. We've got the state paying for whatever it'll pay for, 40, 50 hours a week. But now you've got this pot of resources that you can dip into and pay for that private care in the night hours or on the weekends or, or you know, to make up the difference. And so instead of paying for, say, round the clock care, which at 15 or 20 bucks an hour, you're burning $10,000, $12,000 a month, right? Yep. When my, when my dad was on hospice, so January through the beginning of March of 2017, it was $28 an hour for the two of them. So it was $700 a day, thereabouts. Yep. The uh, private you know, memory care community that we moved her into after he died was actually cheaper. And it was actually better because she had friends. There was activities that she would do with other people that she refused to do with me, which was really annoying. Yeah. And it just, her quality of life in memory care was far better. Now I'm 99% certain those, that community didn't take Medi-Cal. So. That's probably right. and 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 that's that's certainly true. But you know, again, like you said, during that you know maybe during that home care period, you know, um, you know, if you if you had the state say paying three hundred or four hundred of that seven hundred dollars every day, you know, you're at least slowing the bleeding of the savings. <laughs> that's um, true. And, and there's also options here, right? Where where you say, okay, yes, I have this pot of resources that don't count towards a Medicaid. Now, if we want to use those resources to privately pay at a facility that doesn't accept Medicaid because that's the facility we want, great. If maybe over time and as the disease progresses, the the environment is, you know, the all of a sudden the movie theater and the Marvel line countertops are are not as important. <laughs> Right. right. <laughs> um, and and so, you know, maybe you could look at transitioning to another facility that's more economical because, you know, the, the person themselves are not noticing the difference in, in, you know, in the environment. Right. Still getting the same quality of care just at a different price point. Right. Because now. But anyway, I guess my point is, is you're 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 setting up your estate. And, and again, this was just one option or one way to do it. Uh, but you're setting up your state so that the assets do not count towards these government programs. And yet you still turn around and have the flexibility to, if you want to private pay, you private pay. If you don't, you don't. You know, um, I've often said but I can almost break down all of my clients into three categories. There's the the folks that um, uh, whatever whatever happens, they don't want to go to a nursing home, period. Uh, that, and that's what they'll say. I, I ain't never going to a nursing home. Well, you can say that all day long, but you know that's their that's their number one priority. Second is the category of people that do not want to be a burden on others. They don't care where they go. They don't care how much it costs. Just so long as they're not, you know, uh, affecting anybody else's life. Um, and then there's the third category of the people that that just don't want to go broke. They they, they don't care. And, and really, they're not doing it for their own wants and needs, but they want to leave something to their children. And that's I just their... My, I think my mom was in all three categories. She was definitely in A and B. Yeah. She did not want to... She wanted to live in her home forever, and she didn't want to be a burden on my sister and I. Thank you. Those were mutually exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, she, she had Alzheimer's long enough that I never heard any... Um, Desire. She never made the statement that she wanted to make sure that there was money for the for my sister and I and our kids or whatever. But that would be what my mom would have wanted. It had she been in her right mind, so to speak. 
So mm-hmm. yeah, it was fun for being the two categories that were diametrically opposed. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, so and you will see a lot of trust based planning in all of this. But you know, that one one thing I would say out there to to the folks that are listening is when you say the word trust, it's somewhat like saying the word surgery. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, if, if I have a, uh, if I have a little mole removed, well, I mean, I guess arguably that's a surgery, right? It's a surgical procedure. I'm going to the doctor and he's getting his little lance or whatever it is. And he's cutting that off. Um, you know, compare that to, uh, going and having a, a vein taken out of my thigh and wrapped around my heart to replace the one that's uh, not working any longer. That's also surgery. It's also much more complicated and accomplishing a much more sophisticated goal. Um, and and so I have had lots of clients over the years that that have some sort of trust based planning, but it's not necessarily going to accomplish what they think it's going to accomplish. Um, you mentioned like your mom and dad. You know, they've got a trust. Trusts have been real popular in California for years because the probate process is god awful. <laughs> Glad um, we avoided it. <laughs> which is why you avoid it, right? And and particularly in California, New York, Florida, those states are notorious for their their the onerousness of their probate process. So you'll see lots of people use trust as a probate avoidance tool. Yep. But a lot of times they have it in their head that that probate avoidance tool is also a asset protection tool. And it's not necessarily. It could be, you know, um, all trusts are going to generally avoid probate, but not all trusts are going to shield assets from counting for Medicaid or for veterans benefit programs uh, or from lawsuits or or whatever outsider attack is out there. Um, you know, or or that uh, that that, you know, late life uh, marriage, uh, you know, or, or whatever the attack comes from. Um, my my law partner wrote a paper last year on predatory marriage, um, <laughs> which is something that we have seen a rash of in the elder community. Ugh, that's terrible. Uh, yeah, we, she wrote that paper after finishing a guardianship. Uh, uh, we were fighting. We represented the children trying to uh, get guardianship of their father against their stepmother, uh, their stepmother who had just done uh, six years in Huntsville State Penitentiary for financial exploitation of old men. And this was her 16th husband. Oh, dear God. <laughs> One's <laughs> enough. <laughs> no. So it, <laughs> right. So so it is, you know, it is a thing. Uh, um you know, and there's all kinds of interesting issues out there. But yeah, I, I would I would certainly encourage anybody out there, or really anybody, but particularly, you know, if if you're up into your retirement years and you have these sort of concerns, they need to be having their whatever planning they have reviewed specifically with these questions in mind. Um, and and if they don't have any planning, then they need to be seeking it out from somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, there's yep. lots and lots of lawyers out there, um, but we kind of like cockroaches. I mean, they're, they're <laughs> everywhere, right? Um, Same with real estate agents. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, you know, the, uh, the the lawyer that did your divorce in 1978 is not the same guy that designs this trust, right? I Makes mean, those sense. Are, those are, you know, you don't, you don't go to your dentist and ask about your heart palpitation, um, you know, so... You find you find the ones that that really do know what they're doing. That can be somewhat difficult, but um, but but you can do it. So, yeah, we, our our attorney was good, um, and like I said, it's been almost three years, so it's time to review. Probably past time to review. You know, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, so, so I have one question now. One of the my parents' home was paid for. So we rented out mom's home and used her social security and some of their investments to cover the memory care residence that she lived in. Is it possible? Cause you know, in California, you know, homes are a dime a dozen, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) They're cheap. You just buy two or three. (laughs) That's right. And um, so is there a way of protecting the, the, value of the home, whether it's paid for or mostly paid for in this 
in this planning that we're discussing. And I asked that for two reasons. One, ours is not paid for yet because we moved a little over a year ago. And two, I, I facilitate a support group. And one of the issues is a spouse getting to the point where, you know, they need much more hands-on care than one person can manage. And so they need to move into a care facility and, but the spouse needs money to live and, you know, buy groceries and pay the light bill and all that stuff. And that's hard. I mean, I can't imagine that being easy in any state, but it is definitely not easy in some of these coastal states where we have cheap real estate. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so protecting the home is a, is a, you know, for most people, that's going to be either their biggest asset or it'll be the second biggest asset behind their uh, IRA or 401k. You know, for, so that's that's the vast majority of people. That's their biggest asset. And like you said, if you're talking about somebody with a house in in the Bay Area, um, well, you know, I mean, if it's a you know, if it's an 800 square foot shack, <laughs> it's only worth three and a half million dollars. Right. Um, that would be Palo Alto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and so, uh, um, again, going back to the 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 trust book concept, um, and I'll use my own personal situation. Um, my parents retired uh, 15 years ago or so, and they moved to the same town I'm in. They wanted to I'm an only child. and They wanted to be close to my four kids. And um, anyway, so they moved to town and they they got an apartment, but they started house shopping. And for whatever reason, these two fools landed on a two-story house in one Jeez. of the highest property tax districts <laughs> in the town. Um, you know, so the homeowner's insurance is high, the property tax is high, and the second floor of that house might as well be in Ethiopia because they ain't going to either one of these places. Um, you know, my mother's knees, uh, I mean, she's at home on her second knee replacement as we speak. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, so so... Now, luckily, the the master is on the first floor, you know, but my point with all of this is in most states, the home up to a certain equity value is a non-countable asset for something like a Medicaid benefit. Now that, you know, in 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 Texas, for example, that equity limit is six hundred and twenty five thousand um, dollars, which is a lot, which is a lot, especially in Texas. Yeah, um, I, I was I was going to assume that, but I know real estate's gone up dramatically nationwide. Right. Yeah. So outside of, say, Austin, which is like mini Palo Alto, um, you know, because all of the people from Palo Alto have moved to Austin. But so <laughs> other than Austin, um, you know, that's a big house. And in New York, that number goes, I think, up to one point two million um in equity value. And in California, I'm assuming it's probably high. I don't know the number right off the top of my head. but so, so for example, if if my mom or my dad or both needed long term care, their house in and of itself does not count towards their eligibility for a government benefit. But if there's, you know, first of all, if nobody's going to be living there, I don't want it. Yeah, and I don't want to keep upkeep and maintenance and taxes and insurance on a two story house that I'm not living in. So I would want to either sell it or possibly rent it. Um, if I wanted to to make the ridiculous step into residential uh, rental property, um, it's actually but, a good move because you build equity. It, that's true, but then you've got tenants. Um, <laughs> well, that's why you hire a property manager, there like you go. the one that I live with. <laughs> Sp sp spoken like somebody in the real estate business. That's right. Yeah. Well, I'm only I'm adjacent. Because yes. that business makes me nuts. I'd rather stay in the wild west of podcasting. And I used to be, just for your knowledge, I'm basically a retired portrait photographer. Because when we moved, and technology has made iPhones and things, just people think they don't need people like me. They do, but I got tired of arguing with them. So basically <laughs> retired from that. I do the podcasting, not full time because I don't want to. And my husband does real estate and Sometimes just listening to him talk to clients makes me want to like punch myself in the head. So oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly right. <laughs> and but now yeah. the daughter's getting into real estate. So it's like, oh my God, I'm going to be surrounded. <laughs> now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. 
I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. But, you know, if, if, if my parents were in that situation, like I said, I would either want to sell the home or possibly rent it out. But if I, if I were to sell the home, while the home may be an excluded asset for Medicaid eligibility, the proceeds from the sale of a home are dang sure going to mess up their eligibility. Likewise, often the amount of your co-payment to a facility. So if you're on Medicaid, some portion of your income is typically going to go towards the cost of the care, and then the state's going to come in and pick up the balance. That makes sense. The more, the more income you have, the bigger that co-payment's going to be. And so if if you know if all they have is Social Security, um, hey, maybe no big deal. But if they have Social Security and fifteen hundred dollars a month coming in from this rental property, well, that's a whole that you know all I'm doing is just increasing the co-payment. So. With those kind of ideas in mind, for them, I actually created a, a different type of trust. Um, and in their case, this trust was designed so that any of the assets that are in that trust will not count towards their eligibility for Medicaid. Um, we transferred their home into that trust. And at the time, their home did have a mortgage on it. But there is a specific law, it's called the Garn St. Germain Act, uh, that allows you to transfer a mortgage property into a trust like this without triggering any sort of due on sale clause. My mother's got a quarter interest in a farm up in Oklahoma. We transferred that in there that had some CDs and maybe little investments that we were able to put into that trust. They're the trustee of the trust. They're the beneficiaries of the trust. Uh, they manage their own assets. But, but those assets are now, nothing that's in that trust will count towards their eligibility for Medicaid. This particular type of trust, a pre-planning tool, it has to be done five years prior to ever applying for a Medicaid benefit. But we did it when they were in their 60s, they're rolling up at 80 now, so we're all good. Um, Multiples but, of five years at this point. <laughs> right, exactly, right? So, so if they needed nursing home care, I could, for example, step in now as the backup trustee, I could sell that house the proceeds would still be shielded within the boundaries of that trust. Um, and so that's that's why that's why we did it. Or I could rent it and I could keep the income within the trust without distributing it, which wouldn't affect their co-payment towards the nursing home or or any of that sort of stuff. So again, there are you know, different stages, different plans. Um, but yeah, protecting the home, since that's often the biggest asset that people have, is is critical. That makes sense. And these are really helpful conversations because I know, like, I frequently say that we were blessed because my parents' house was paid for, my dad had investment accounts, so my mom did not lack for funds. And she had enough money between all of her assets that had she lived for 15 years, like I assumed she would, we would have been fine. <clears throat> and I'm super frugal, so, you know, <laughs> I always worried about her running out of money, and my husband kept saying... We're doing X and that's not even touching the house. And he was always reassuring me, which never worked because I always worry about money. <laughs> um, but then when I think of Medi-Cal or Medicaid, I think of people that are not standard, whatever that means, middle class, you know, like us, you know, and I've had conversations with friends who have a better retirement than I will because they didn't, weren't self-employed forever. <laughs> And they've had these conversations like, what do you do if your parent needs care? And it's like, do you sell the house? And I'm like, well, this is what we did and this is why. 
And now I know why, because we did our trust. We were in between home purchases and man, my husband was like, we got to get the, ha- the new house in the trust. I mean, it was like, we barely moved in and it was like, we got to get the house in the trust. And I'm like, I'm sure there's a little slack period. Okay. <laughs> now I know why he was so worried about it, but yeah, that was, that was, we moved December 15th, 2021. And I'm sure it was in the trust before the end of the year. That is how important that was to him. So that's his thing. He does the real estate. I didn't worry about it. Um, so now I know why it was such a big deal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and and that's that's again. These are just uh, yeah. These are just examples. And it's everybody's situation going to be a little bit different. You know, depending on age, stage. Um, you know, the the plan I, I would be looking at doing for somebody who's healthy and sixty five. Uh, and looking towards the future versus the plan I'm putting together for somebody who had a stroke last week and is currently, you know, halfway through their Medicare days at the nursing home, and they're probably not going to come back home. Well, that's a different plan because we've got, you know, a month to figure it out. Um, you know, not, you know, not the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, so yeah, but, but I will say that it's, it is almost never too late. And, some of the common things that I hear from people is, you know, I have too much. I would never be eligible for those benefits or, or this or that. Um, and that's just not true. It's just a lack, that's a lack of knowledge. Um, and, and once you get with somebody uh, who really knows this stuff backward and forward, you know, much like, you know, if, if it's April 15th, and you you've got to do your taxes, right? Do you call the IRS and say, "Hey, um, I don't know how much tax I owe, but but would y'all tell me?" <laughs> no, <laughs> no, right? I mean, that's that's insanity. That you know, that's just pure insanity. Uh, you would be never... lucky if you got anybody to answer the phone, much less answer <laughs> right. that question. <laughs> right, and and you would certainly never expect them to find all of the available deductions so that you would pay the bare minimum in tax that you're legally required to pay. No, you 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 instead you go to a CPA who is very familiar with all the rules and they 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 go through just mountains of IRS statutes and regulations to determine the best way to take deductions and and fit you into this complex government system um and then they report it to the IRS on your behalf so that they can mm-hmm. explain it to the IRS in the IRS's language and and this is very similar where if you're interacting with the Veterans Affairs Administration, the Health and Human Services Commission, uh, Social Security, for that matter, pretty much any of the government entities out there, you want somebody who knows all those rules and regulations can 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 put you into the best position and then explain how all of that was done in the language that that government agency likes. That makes sense. You'll be impressed because our CPA is also our attorney or our attorney is also our CPA, depending on what we need at the time. <laughs> there you go. When I first, I learned about him, he was running for our city council in our old town. And I thought, now how is somebody who's all numbers and law, how can they think outside the box? This guy can think outside the box. He's amazing. Well, but you do things his way. <laughs> well, but I, it's, I will say it, that. In, in this field, that's actually it. so. I, I, my undergraduate degree is in accounting. Um, my my wife, who's also my business partner, uh, CPA lawyer. <laughs> um, in in this field, it is a weird combination of of money tax issues and law issues, and they they all come into play because if I don't design that trust, if I design it just for Medicaid purposes. I may miss out on some tax benefits or create a tax consequence that's unwanted. So I need to be designing that trust in a way that it's also accomplishing those goals as well, right? I I don't want you to lose your homestead exemption. Um, I don't want you, I want you to be able to sell that home and get a tax-free sale of a personal residence, um, you know, those sort of things. So I want to be able to do all of that. 
And 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 that's yeah, that's where having that technical background in in some accounting or finance really does help. So yeah, no, I, I actually wouldn't be surprised at all to find that your uh, <laughs> that your 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 pro has both of those things going on. That's interesting. Um, I think the the trust attorney that we used because our CPA attorney person is predominantly retired. He still does our taxes, um, and he. <laughs> This kind of blows my mind, but they researched the best state to retire in and they moved to Arkansas, which <laughs> being from California and moving to Arkansas to me does not make sense just because yeah. of the cultural difference, but they seem very happy. So that's all that matters. And, you know, it's not the well, choice I'll make, but that's okay. And if, if they are in Northwest Arkansas, um, uh, uh then, then it actually would probably not be near the culture shock that you think it is, um, because Benton, Ar uh, Benton, Arkansas is the home of Walmart. Mm -hmm. Every company that does business with Walmart is required to have an office in Benton, Arkansas. Hmm. That's interesting. So, so you're going to have executives from Procter and Gamble and Johnson and Johnson and their teams and their staff. And those folks are coming from New York and California and Chicago. And, and so it is a, it is a diverse population up there. Now you get down here where I'm at in Southern Arkansas, and you can probably tell by my accent, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's a bit of a cultural difference down here. Uh, but uh, but I actually live part of the time here and part of the time in Hot Springs, Arkansas, which is a resort town, uh, one of the few places with natural hot springs. And 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 it really is a beautiful place. I lived in California for a while when I was in the Marines. Um, and a uh, uh, nice place to visit. But <laughs> kind of like your friends, uh, your CPA, I'm uh, happy to come back to this part of the, to the, of the country. Where were you stationed when you were a Marine? I uh, went to boot camp in San Diego and uh, infantry school in Camp Pendleton. Uh, and then uh, I spent the rest of the time in 29 Palms, California, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I laugh. My dad was a Marine for four years, and that's exactly what he did. And my dad liked it in the – he was the San Francisco kind of weather guy, even though we lived about 40 miles, 30 miles northeast of San Francisco. He liked it cooler. So 29 Palms, not his idea of weather. <laughs> he, he didn't enjoy 120 degree summers. No. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, it, 29 Palms is a pretty miserable, uh, it's a pretty miserable base. Uh, I, I don't think anybody would argue against that one. Yeah, he probably would have stayed in longer. He was in for four years, but yeah, he 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 got out because, yeah, 29 Palms, not, not his idea of living. <laughs> I've always said uh, two of the best decisions I ever made was uh, joining the Marines and then getting back out after four <laughs> years. I laugh because that's kind of how my dad was. Now, there is a pretty big cultural difference between Northern California and Southern California. I don't know if you knew that. See, I'm a multi-generational Californian, also known as a unicorn, because there aren't too many of us anymore. <laughs> so it's, it's really interesting, the difference between North and Southern California. Yeah, I actually have a friend, uh, one of my Marine buddies that uh, lives up in Fremont. And I was uh, uh, I was actually up there visiting him uh, just just prior to COVID. So probably 20, uh, 2019 um, was the last time I, I was up there. And, that, and it really is. I mean, that is beautiful country. It really is, that, that whole area. Um, now, we did cross the bridge and go into San Francisco. And, and if I don't go back, that'd be fine. Um, <laughs> a lot of people say that. I think San Francisco is really unique. It is, but I just, you know, not again, I'm, I will say uh, that, you know, just the traffic and, and all of that. Um, you know, I, I, I often joke that, you know, if it's a really, really bad traffic day, then it's going to take me five minutes to get to work instead of three. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm just barely exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, well, Fremont is, oh boy, that's a packed town. And My yeah, husband's from Sunnyvale. So yeah. he's from Sunnyvale yeah. and he was born in, well, he wasn't born there, but he grew up first half of his life, Staten Island, moved to California when he was 13, 
lived in the southern, you know, South Bay, Fremont, Sunnyvale, Cupertino. His parents' mm-hmm. townhouse is about two miles from Apple headquarters. So you want to talk about property values? <laughs> huh, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but like I said, we moved from the San Francisco Bay Area. We lived in the suburbs with farms and and tract homes and all all sorts of everything, too. We're an hour north of Sacramento and an hour south of Tahoe. So less traffic, very beautiful. But it's, you know, it's California. With, you know, it's like yeah. uh, we just the, got back from Southern California. We went to the Rose Bowl Parade. So that was awesome. The uh, the people that live two houses down from me in Hot Springs, uh, they they summer in Hot Springs and they winter in Tahoe. Oh, OK. So, some of your, or, well, or, if they're or, if they're in Tahoe right now, <laughs> I think that I read something like two hundred trillion gallons of rain this week in California. Ooh. Maybe it was t- I know I was like, that's not even a number I can wrap my head around. And so we're at 1,550 ele- feet elevation. So we're above the fog and below the snow. Yeah. Tahoe is getting clobbered. Yeah. Well, then they're <laughs> the whole probably state's getting, getting clobbered. That's probably yeah. why they're, they're, I haven't seen them because they're stuck wherever <laughs> yeah. they are. I mean, I don't know if you've watched the news, but holy Toledo, man, the whole California is like flooded and washing away. <laughs> so the property values are going to go up again for those of us whose homes are still stationary <laughs> yeah stationary and dry yeah well yeah we're still staying dry so is there any last i mean we could probably do like a whole other hour on protecting assets because i oh, haven't yeah. even gotten into other stuff but maybe we'll have to do that another day is there any other last bits of advice that you would give the listeners on because well, obviously we're talking about planning on how to protect assets for the future and like I said, we'll have to get back together again and talk about how to protect assets for your loved ones I, I, currently. You know, the, the most important thing out there, uh, I I do a uh, I do a, a very uh, I do a speech on a pretty regular basis that I, that I call the uh, my five mistakes, and it's my it's the five most common mistakes that people make, and the last one mistake number five, and it's the one that we have all made at some point, myself included, and that's the mistake of doing absolutely nothing. And, and you know, we know all of these things are coming. And if you look at the statistics on Alzheimer's and stuff like that, you're, you're, you got a better chance of getting it than you do of not getting it these days. I mean, it's, it, you know, um, and then you combine that with all the other potential issues that come with getting older and that sort of stuff. Um, but people have been not doing anything for a long time. Um, we, we can go all the way back to the Old Testament. <laughs> um, so uh, you, had, uh, you had Isaac in the Old Testament. He had his two boys, Jacob and Esau. And Esau was the oldest boy. He's a big, hairy man's man. Uh, kind of, I always kind of thought in my head of like the 1970s Burt Reynolds. <laughs> right you know mm-hmm. very, that's a tough guy and then he's got the he's got his other son jacob who's kind of a mama's boy and a little soft kid and and uh and of course mama's favorite right? right well the jewish tradition at the time was you would bestow your blessing on the oldest child which at that stage and there's actually even a jewish word for it but uh but that that's essentially where we get the whole concept of a will um, hmm. it's, it goes all the way back to that. Right. And so, so essentially what we're talking about here is, is Isaac is going to leave everything to his oldest son. That's the plan. That's what all the Jewish people do. So everybody knows the plan, but what does Isaac sense. do? Isaac does absolutely nothing. He just waits and he waits. And then at some point he's, he's bedridden, he's blind. He knows he's about to die. And even then, He's not quite ready. He's, he, he grabs Esau and he says, hey, go out and hunt me my favorite meal and come bring it back. And we'll have some stew. And then once we get done with that, then I'm finally going to get around uh, to, to leaving you all my stuff, doing my planning. And so Esau, being the dutiful child, runs off to do his thing. Well, meanwhile, we've got Rebecca and she's listening in and she's looking over at her favorite boy, Jacob, and saying, look, you're about to lose out on this deal. You need to get in there because your old man, 
at this stage in life, and in, in, in my practice, what we call frail, vulnerable, but not incompetent. Okay. Right? And that's mm-hmm. Isaac. He's blind. He's bedridden. And so Rebecca says, look, Jacob, you go in there and just pretend like you're Esau. Your old man won't know the difference. And, and, and Jacob says, no, mom, there's no way because my brother, he's a big, hairy beast of a man. I'm this little scrawny kid. It's not going to work. She says, no, I got this all figured out. We're going to wrap you up in goat fur. And you're going to go in there. And sure enough, Jacob goes in there wrapped up in goat fur. And, and all Isaac can do is reach out and touch that goat fur. And because he's so frail and he's so vulnerable that even though he's competent, he bestows his blessing on the child he did not intend to. His entire estate plan, the estate plan that everybody knew about, goes bad because he waited too long. I was really surprised because we did our trust. I was almost 54. My husband was almost 56. And I was like, man, we, we've, we've just, we're like late to the game. And the attorney's like, ah, no. Yeah, nope. see, you're laughing because, you know, Obviously, more people fall into number five, wait too long, don't do anything. I mean, a lot of ours was just, you know, you don't think about it. And then you think about it, you're like, oh, my gosh, cost money. And uh, you know, you come up with all the stupid excuses. And then once we did it, it wasn't that expensive compared to probate, which mm-hmm. I have not experienced in California, thank God. So I'm sure what we spent for the attorney was well worth avoiding that. And then all of this planning for the future, for future care, or protecting assets. Sounds like a bargain, actually. That's, and then, yeah, I mean, that's, that's exactly right. But ultimately, they've just got to do it. And and so, yeah, that that's my that'd be my final piece of advice is is just just go and do it. Stop sitting on the train tracks and listening to the whistle and watching the <laughs> light get bigger. That train's coming. Get off the tracks. Go do something. Well, fortunately, I think I see a shift in people discussing end of life stuff instead of avoiding it. And so we're mm-hmm. generationally where, you know, I mean, everybody's going to die. So like, let's just plan for what we want at end of life, how we want to take, be taken care of what we want to do with what we have left. I mean, it's, it really isn't that it's not depressing. It's not scary. There's some tough questions occasionally. And then you work through them and, you know, cause our daughter has a, a autoimmune disease. And so one of the questions was, what do you do if you die be- or she dies before you guys? And I was like, excuse me, but that is a very terrible question. <laughs> right. But, but it was re- necessary. Right. And I had yep. to think about it for a little bit. She is married. So now the answer is different. Not well, it isn't different. The answer would have been slightly easier had right. they been married when we started, but that's okay. So, you know, you think things through and then you realize you're overthinking things. You're, you're putting your own personal values, opinions, et cetera, on things that you really just don't need to do. So like I said, you, like you said, just do it. It's really not that, it's not that big a deal, really. Bad and you will feel better in the end. Exactly. We did it and it was like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And here we're having this conversation and I'm like, okay, I need to double check on a couple things. Obviously we did our trust healthy, still working, blah, 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 you know, but you know, my husband would like to retire in the next 10 years or so. So we had to kind of, you know, Double check, make sure everything's on track for what we've discussed. And Absolutely. that won't be a big deal either. Very cool. Well, I appreciate this. And if you're interested, we'll get back together again in the future and talk about what we can do to protect assets of our loved ones who are cognitively impaired, because that obviously is a big problem as well. Sounds like a plan. All right. Thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.